uh, but I first met him between services here at Doxology. And uh, when he first walked up and introduced himself to me, he just walked up and his very first words to me were uh, really nervous. You could tell he was just dying. He says, um, is it okay for me to be here? I'd never met the guy before in my life and kind of looked at him and looked around and thought, um, I think, I think so. Why do you ask? And he lost it. He just started sobbing. And he said, man, I grew up in church. I walked away a long time ago. Uh, I just came back last week from Afghanistan, and I'm not doing good. And my grandma said, son, you better get your butt to church. And he said, I'm trying, but this is the third one that I've been to today. And the other two told me I couldn't stay because of my tattoos. He trusted Christ that morning at doxology. And he almost didn't. Because he almost didn't show up. Because he'd been two places that had told him he had to behave before he could ever belong. Happy Sunday. Great to worship with you guys today. And in fact, uh, especially today, you sound great today. Uh, not if sure if you're aware of that, but it's like a wall of sound coming this way uh, from you today. So great singing today. It's good to have you here and great to worship with you this morning. Yeah, absolutely. It's good to worship with you. If you got a Bible, would you uh, grab it and meet me in Ephesians chapter 6? Ephesians chapter 6 is where we're going to be today. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, we're wrapping up uh, a, a series that we've been in for the last several weeks uh, called Behind the Schemes, taking the surprise out of Satan's strategies. So Ephesians chapter 6 is actually we're going to start today as we wrap up uh, that series talking about the third part of Satan's schemes today. 2011, the FBI wrapped up what was the most extensive manhunt in the whole Bureau's history. They wrapped it up in 2011 when they arrested James Whitey Bulger, the mob boss from Boston. He'd been on the run from the FBI for 16 years. And just to give you a little perspective on how bad this bad guy was, for most of the 16 years that he was on the run, he spent his time at number two on the FBI's most wanted list. Right behind a guy that I'm sure you've heard of, a, a guy named Osama bin Laden. James Whitey Bulger was a bad dude. And yet when the FBI finally caught up with him and arrested him, they didn't find him in a cave. They didn't find him hiding out in exile in some foreign country. They found him living in an apartment in Santa Monica, California, just about three blocks walk from the beach, hiding, as it were, in plain sight. Nobody had any idea. In fact, the media interviewed his landlord. Landlord didn't have a clue. They interviewed most of his neighbors. The neighbors had no idea who was living right next to them. They just assumed that this guy and his girlfriend were another retired couple living out a limited pension in Santa Monica like the rest of them were. They had no idea that this guy, their neighbor, had nearly a million dollars in cash stashed in the walls of his apartment. That he had an arsenal of automatic and semi-automatic weapons and hand grenades enough to take out a small army without reloading. They had no idea. They had no idea that he was wanted in connection with 19 different murders 
that one guy he sent to live with the fish with his bare hands and then taken a nap in his bed before making his escape. His neighbors didn't know. They had no idea. One of the interviews asked one of the neighbors, didn't you notice anything strange? To which the neighbor replied, no lie. Well, I did notice he was awfully nice to cats. So there you go. That's a dead giveaway. (laughs) Got my eyes on a few of you. He was hiding in plain sight. And nobody knew. Even the people that knew who they were looking for, they didn't know what to look for. And so they missed him, even though he moved in right next to them, worked right beside them. They missed it. For the last few weeks, we've been spending our time talking about something similar, but not public enemy number two, spiritual enemy number one. We've said the Bible doesn't spend a lot of time doing character development on Satan. He's not the primary person that we're supposed to put our focus on, and yet over and over the scriptures say we can't be unaware of his schemes. So that's been the focus of the series. Week one, we talked about his scheme as a deceiver. And then last week, we talked about his desire to distract us, and this week, we're talking about division. Division. And I want to ask you a question that ambushed me a few months ago at 68 miles an hour on I-20. I just uh, was about 100 yards past the Winscott exit, starting to slow down to take my exit on 377. That's how I know it was 68 miles an hour when I heard the question. And it so ambushed me, I had to pull over to the side of the road and sort of regain my composure. I don't remember who the podcaster was. I don't even remember what the rest of the podcast was about. But the question was like one of those big, strong magnets that just takes a whole lot of stuff, and I didn't know that was all out there, and it sucked it all together and ambushed me all at the same time. I wasn't prepared for it. That's how I remember it so well. It was a simple question may or may not have the same effect on you, but I want to pose it to you anyway. The question was this. Who did you lose last year? When I heard the question, it was a few months ago, and last year referred to 2020 and 2021. And yet the interviewer wasn't asking the question about COVID-19. Wasn't talking about people that you lost to death or some other kind of disease. The guy asking the question was asking, Who did you lose last year over politics? Who did you lose over masks or no masks? Vaccines, no vaccines. Who did you lose over the election? over the events of January the 6th at the Capitol, who did you lose? Who did you lose over racial tension? CRT, BLM, Antifa, QAnon? Who did you lose last year? Was it a friend? A roommate? A family member? Sibling? Parent? Was it a coworker, or an aunt, or an uncle? Someone in your church family. Maybe someone who was so close to you that you thought nothing would ever come between you. And then something came between you, and you never saw it coming. You were too far right, or too far left, or not far enough right, or not far enough left. You were too loud or too silent about something that they thought you should have been louder or more silent about. You said too much or you didn't say enough, or they did, and nobody died, but something died. It's not just out there in the world. 
happens in the church. There's an enemy who loves to hide in plain sight, and he doesn't just like cats. He loves to deceive. He loves to distract. And he would love to divide the body of Christ. We can't be unaware of his schemes because they're not new schemes. In fact, one of the earliest followers of Jesus, a guy named Paul, wrote several letters back to churches that he was aware of in the first century, and in almost every single one of them, he addresses this particular scheme. He talks about division. And it's the same scheme, but the enemy loves to run different routes. And I want to show you three today in books that are back to back to back, because I think the same three are alive and active and perhaps hiding in plain sight in all of our lives as well. Ephesians chapter 6 is where I want us to start. This is a familiar passage when it comes to spiritual warfare or the schemes of the enemy. Look back at it one more time. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, Paul writes this as he summarizes the book. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Put on the full armor of God. This is a familiar passage if you grew up in church. It's sort of like low-hanging fruit for Sunday school teachers, isn't it? The armor of God. And you got in your mind, if you grew up in church, the armor of God coloring books and armor of God costumes and armor of God flannel board illustrations, you know? Maybe the armor of God shaming if you forgot your Bible when you showed up to church on Sunday morning. Some of you remember that? Mr. Freeland, where's your Bible today? Well, I forgot it, Mr. Phillips. How are you going to go into battle if you forget your sword? Like, well, sorry, I would have brought my sword, but I was using it with my little brother this morning before I came, you know. I'm not against that. Okay, I'm against some of that, but I'm not against all of that. And yet, if we're not careful, sometimes we can look at Ephesians chapter 6 and just assume it's a little bit of a bolt-on illustration that Paul wrote at the end of a book that has nothing to do with the rest of what he said. Sort of like he wrote along to this church and talks about some of the great glories of the faith all throughout Ephesians. And he gets to the very end and he's like, and by the way, here's this illustration that's going to kill with fourth grade boys someday. But that's not what Ephesians 6 is at all. In fact, Ephesians chapter 6 and the armor of God is the summary illustration that drives home everything Paul's said up to this point. In a whole book that talks about a scheme of an enemy to divide what Jesus is putting together. In fact, if you just think back through Ephesians, if you're familiar with it, Ephesians chapter 1 talks about enemies of God. Ephesians chapter 2 talks about cultural issues, racial issues within a culture. Chapter 3 talks about the same thing. Chapter 4 talks about the church. Chapter 5 talks about the home. We see over and over and over the scheme of an enemy who would love to divide what Jesus is bringing together. Over and over and over, that's the enemy's scheme. And Paul sums it all up. When life feels like you're in a battle, whether it's on a cultural level or a church level or a marriage level, or a family level, or a coworker level, don't be surprised at the schemes of the enemy. And Paul tells us how the scheme plays out, at least one way here. He tells us what to beware of. He says the first part of the scheme of the enemy is to get you and me to fight the wrong enemy. The enemy loves to divide us by getting us to fight the wrong enemy. Do you see what he says there? Notice in verse 12. Paul says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and powers of the dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You understand what Paul's saying? Our enemy is not the culture. It's not the flesh and blood people who have been deceived or recruited 
or taken captive or enslaved towards the cause of an enemy who seeks to destroy them too. Paul's saying, when you understand the scheme of the enemy, you don't victimize victims of the enemy. One of the sneakiest schemes of the enemy is to get followers of Jesus to destroy people Jesus died for and all in the name of Jesus. To get us to believe that we're doing the Lord's work as we're destroying people Jesus came to save. What would change in our world? I wonder what would change in your world if instead of seeing flesh and blood people or categories of people as the enemy, we saw them as people who were deceived by a mutual enemy, distracted by a mutual enemy, who would love nothing more than to destroy them and to use us. We partner with a couple of organizations uh, who are involved in rescuing uh, primarily individuals who are held captive in trafficking. And in some cases, they go in and do sting operations in these places where they discover that somebody's being held or a group of people are being held uh, as captives. Uh, and sometimes for so long that they have a hard time even believing or knowing or understanding what's true. Uh, and when these teams find someone in one of those places that's been victimized, that's held captive like that, they don't divide and separate from them. They mobilize and move near to them, right? And they don't just stand outside the building and scream truth into them. They move towards them. They speak truth. They do it courageously. They also do it gently and compassionately, patiently, because they realize that the victim is not the enemy. It's how Paul's inviting us to see the flesh and blood people that we live life near. A whole world full of people that we would otherwise be tempted to see as our enemies. He says our enemy is not flesh and blood. But I told you this is not the only place that Paul talks about the enemy's schemes. It's not the only place that he talks about this scheme. If you got your Bible open, flip back uh, one book to Galatians chapter 1. Maybe just a couple of pages. In my Bible, it's, I think, three pages to get back to Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. Paul writes to another church in another city. He describes a different route that the enemy takes in the same scheme of division. Look what he says to introduce the book, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. He says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel which is really no gospel at all. It's not good news at all. Evidently, he says, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel, the good news of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. So here's the situation that Paul was addressing. Some teachers had come into this place called Galatia and had begun to teach the people there. You know, the message that Paul told you was good it was just too simple. Like the idea that you trust Jesus for everlasting life and abundant life with empty and open hands, that you receive him by grace through faith, that's good, but you're going to have to contribute some stuff to the process as well. You're going to have to start keeping our rules. You're going to have to start obeying the laws. You're going to have to start looking like us right down to the most intimate details. Paul writes the whole book to say, hang on a second. Either Jesus is a fully sufficient Savior or he's not. Jesus did not die on a cross to bring you most of the way to God. He wasn't crucified to be a co-savior alongside you. Jesus' death on a cross was fully sufficient to make you right before God. Period. And Paul says when you subtract something from the message, you change the message. 
When you add something to the message, you change the message. And when you change the message, you take good news and flip it into bad news and load it on the backs of everybody else. And then as he wraps it up, as he describes this whole issue through the whole book, when he summarizes the book, you don't have to turn there, but write down Galatians chapter 4, verse 3. Galatians chapter 4, verse 3, this is what Paul says. He says, we grew up this way. We don't have to live that way anymore. We were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world, captive to our religion and all of the things that we'd added on to trust in Christ that had become bad news for us. That sounds like Ephesians, doesn't it? The elemental spiritual forces of the world, same language. He says this whole thing is a part of the scheme of the enemy to hold you captive and divide you among each other by competing to see who deserves God's love the most. The enemy's scheme is to divide you so that you fight the wrong enemy. But the second route that he runs inside the same theme, he loves to make laws a litmus test. He loves to divide us by making laws a litmus test, where if a person doesn't meet our personal standard of behavior, we declare they don't belong at all. I told you before uh, about a guy who's become a friend of mine over the last several years, uh, but I first met him between services here at Doxology, and uh, when he first walked up and introduced himself to me, he just walked up, and his very first words to me were uh, really nervous. You could tell he was just dying. He says, um, is it okay for me to be here? I'd never met the guy before in my life and kind of looked at him and looked around and thought, um, I think, I think so. Why do you ask? And he lost it. He just started sobbing. And he said, man, I grew up in church. I walked away a long time ago. Uh, I just came back last week from Afghanistan, and I'm not doing good. And my grandma said, son, you better get your butt to church. And he said, I'm trying, but this is the third one that I've been to today. And the other two told me I couldn't stay because of my tattoos. He trusted Christ that morning at doxology. And he almost didn't. Because he almost didn't show up. Because he'd been two places that had told him he had to behave before he could ever belong. That's sort of a low-hanging fruit example to highlight the extreme, they get a little closer to home, don't they? And that's not to say that how we behave or how we live is unimportant at all. But anytime we put behave in front of believe and belong, Paul says we're playing right into the hands, right into the scheme of a spiritual enemy who would love to divide us, and deceive us, and distract us. We make laws and our laws, a litmus test. The last one's related, but flip back past Ephesians to Colossians chapter 2. It's the next book after uh, that, uh, just a, a couple more books uh, to, to Colossians chapter 2. Look what Paul says to the church there, beginning in verse 6. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, Paul says this, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, empty hands, open hands, by grace through faith, you trusted in him. Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your life in him. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of the world rather than on Christ. It's the same language, same scheme, different route. Turns out Paul's dealing with a really similar issue in the Colossians, what they were dividing over in Galatia, but he takes a little bit different angle in describing it here. Here he cautions them about hollow and deceptive philosophy. He says they come from the same place as they did in Galatia and in Ephesus. The same scheme, different route, elemental spiritual forces of the world. The enemy tries to get us divided by getting us to fight the wrong enemy, 
by making laws a litmus test, and finally by making human philosophies a fellowship test. Making philosophies a fellowship test. And notice here he talks about hollow and deceptive philosophies. We talked in week one about how the deceiver's favorite way to go about deceiving people is to give them a lie that's almost entirely true with a twist at the end. But Paul's not talking here when he talks about deceptive philosophies or hollow philosophies. He's not talking about things like flat earth philosophy that just on its face most of us look at and go, <laughs> that's obviously false. That's not the enemy's favorite thing to show people and put in front of them. The enemy loves to throw out ideas that look good to us, remember? That seem right to us, that maybe even appear godly to us. The enemy loves for us to look godly in ways that don't depend on God. That don't lead to God. That don't point to God. They just appear godly. To us. One of the enemy's favorite things to do is take one of those philosophies, and come on, especially in a world like ours, one of those that has a whole lot of truth and just a little bit of lie, and to throw it out there in front of people that follow Jesus. Because he knows that some of us are going to grab a hold of the part that's clearly true, that seems true, that seems right, that seems good, and we're going to grab a hold of it. And a few of us are going to grab a hold of the part that is obviously false. That's not true. Some of us will instantly see the true part. Some of us will instantly see the false part and will cling to it and destroy each other over it. Because we both know that we're clinging to something that's right. Deceitful philosophies. Hollow philosophies too. Style and no substance. Depends on human traditions, elemental forces of the world rather than on Christ. That's how you know, isn't it? Does this philosophy that I'm clinging to depend on Jesus? Does it begin with Jesus? Does it end with Jesus? Does it point to Jesus? Does it lead to Jesus? We asked the 50 billion year question last week. It's a good one for philosophies and traditions too. Will this philosophy still matter in 50 billion years? Or does it just matter for the here and now? And if it's just a here and now thing, it doesn't mean that it's unimportant. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be passionate about it. I mean, in that category, fall things like political ideologies, human philosophy, social theories, Things on a host of different levels. And they all matter. And some of them are really, really important. Politics are really, really important in our world where we live. The idea here isn't that we shouldn't care about them. It's that we can't be led astray by them. And we can't be held captive to them. They can't be the boss of us. You know what the bosses of us do? They rule our lives. They rule our thoughts, and they determine who we can and can't be friends with. If we can't fellowship with a person with whom we agree about Jesus, but disagree about that, whatever that is, if they're not welcome at our table, they're not welcome in our circles, they're not welcome in our conversations, it's a fairly good indication that a human philosophy is nearer to us than the most important thing about us. And frankly, it's a pretty good indication that we're no longer following Jesus. Not that we're not going to heaven when we die. That's not what I'm saying. That would be making a law a litmus test. I'm not going to do that this morning in a message about not doing that. It's an indication that we're not following Jesus while we live. Because that's not the way Jesus lived. Jesus was constantly playing host to people with whom he and they had nothing in common. They disagreed about everything. In fact, when you look through the Gospels at the people that Jesus sat down to eat with, they record Jesus sitting down for dinner with people that he vehemently disagreed with on almost everything, at least as often as they record him sitting down at dinner with his disciples. Speaking of the disciples, 
Jesus brought people into his inner circle who were recovering terrorists, barroom brawlers, sex workers, and self-righteous hypocrites. All of them were welcome at Jesus' table. All of them were invited into Jesus' family. They were invited to belong even before they behaved. In fact, I said this a couple of weeks ago to somebody. Uh, the resurrection is indisputably the most significant miracle in all of human history. I think we could all agree on that. But the second one, and I don't think it's missing it by a bunch, is how Jesus got Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector to live and do life together and together with him for three and a half years without destroying each other in the process. How did that happen? Well, because right there in the middle of them was someone who was bigger to them than all of the some things. Holding them together despite everything else that could have ripped them apart. Look, this is a huge scheme of the enemy in our world today, in the church with a capital C today. I read an article not too long ago about the great migration between churches during and post-COVID. Now, one of the things that we've seen in churches just over the last several years, um, especially during the pan pandemic and the political climate uh, that we live in, is the di disappearance of the nominal Christian. Uh, just people who were, who were just crowd sitters in churches aren't anymore. Over the last couple of years, they've just figured out something else to do with their Sunday morning. The nominal Christian doesn't really exist in today's church in the United States anymore. But the other thing that people who study these kinds of things are noticing and calling out and seeing that I think is going to take a, a lot longer to unwind and have a lot, lot, lot greater impact and more severe implications in the church today is that over the last couple of years, innumerable people have changed churches in order to join a church that they feel like aligns more with their political views. They didn't like the way that their prior church did mask requirements. So they went to find one they liked better. They decided that their church was too politically liberal or too politically conservative. So they switched to a church that took a stance like the stance their politics agreed with. Same thing with racial unrest. Didn't like the way our church handled the Sunday after the George Floyd incident. And so they went online and started shopping for pastors who said exactly what they would say, exactly the way that they would say it, with exactly the amount of weight that they would have given to it. And when they found one they did, they went there or came here. We chose uniformity over unity. And overall, I believe the church is weaker for it like a tree that's never exposed to the wind. We find ourselves in danger of being weaker with roots that are shallower, that are anchored to the wrong things. And perhaps, Paul's words, anchored by the wrong things, held captive. In fact, in a lot of ways, Paul over and over and over in talking to the churches during his day in their culture and their society makes a point like this. In a world like ours, Christ followers often reveal ourselves more by how we battle than how we behave. That's true in our world, just like it was true in Paul's world. Most of your neighbors who are not following Jesus are moral people. They're even nice and religious people. Remember from week one, that's part of the enemy's deception. He's not just trying to get you to play with Ouija boards and hold seances and drink goat's blood, you know? He would love for you to be a good, moral, church-going member of society as long as you never see and as long as you never show a need for Jesus. Good behavior doesn't bother him. And it generally doesn't cost us. But my friend Deidre reminded me this week, entering a battle for the life of our enemies does take work, and a lot of it. Division doesn't take any work. Outrage doesn't take any work. If we want to be divided, we don't have to fight to be divided. So it makes sense 
that we would need to armor up, carrying with us the truth of who Jesus is and all he's done for us and all he's called us to be if we want to be people who are unified in a world that would love to divide. And when we do, every time we do. When we sit down at a table for dinner, when we raise our hands in worship together next to people who look nothing like us and think nothing like us about human philosophies and traditions, when so many ways are so different from us, when we choose to worship despite it, Paul says it's like a kingdom flag planted in the land of principalities and powers of darkness that declares we are not surprised by your scheme. We know who you are, and we know whose we are, and we will not be divided by you. There's a new family. There's a new community, a stronger unity than anything you could tear apart, and you will not win in the world that Jesus has overcome. We will not be deceived. We will not be destroyed. We will not be divided because we are not unaware of your schemes. And the gates of hell will not prevail over the one who's overcome the world. Would you bow your head with me? Lord, it is so simple to be divided And we look at things in our world that are big deals, that are important things. We recognize how easy it is to pick the wrong enemy. How easy it is to make behavior a litmus test for belonging. How easy it is, Lord, for our individual philosophies to become tests for fellowship. And we ask that we would be able to live differently that we wouldn't stop caring about the things that matter, the things that are important here and now, but we would never put them in front of the thing that matters the most, of who you are and whose we are. Would you let us follow you in a world like this? Would you let us look like you and walk like you and talk like you in this world, wherever you send us from here? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. If something you heard resonated with you today, we would love to connect with you. Visit doxology.church connect or leave a comment below. And if you enjoyed today's message and you wanna see more, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new videos.